Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a far taste of glory divine. Fair salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy whispers of love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior and happy and blessed. And waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness. Awesome. Sing it out. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Number 368. 368, not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul nor what this toiling flesh is born can make my spirit whole. Thy word alone, my Savior, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Numbers 368. Not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul, not what this toiling flesh has borne, can make my spirit whole. Thy work alone, Savior, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Ladies, verse 2. Ladies, not. Nah. Everybody, I work alone, my Savior, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can ease this weight of Men on verse 3, men. Thy to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to Thee, and rid me of this dark unrest, and set my spirit free. Everybody, Thy work alone, my Savior, can ease this weight of sin. Uh, alone, O Lamb of God, can we sense peace with 35 and under? 30
35 and under, verse 4. Everybody, thy work alone, my Savior, can ease this weight of sin. Alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Okay, 36 and up. Here we go. I praise. Sing it out. I trust his love and mine. He, he calls me his, I call him mine. My God, my joy, my light. Everybody, thy work alone, my Savior, can ease this weight of sin. Thy one alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace with Him. Thank you. This time we have the announcements. Well, good afternoon. We have less of a crowd. That's what happens. Uh, our last meeting will have Dr. Joe McHale, McHale sorry. Uh, my wife always yells at me for mispronouncing. So, I, I got to give you a Dr. Joe story. One of the first times we were together was in the Yosemite conference. And being an ex-paramedic and an EMT fireman, I went up to Dr. Joe and I said, Hey, uh, we've got an older gentleman here, doctor, that we'd like to make sure if anything happens, that the younger steps up. So I said, if you're not speaking, uh, we'd like to, you know, can you, he said, I'd be happy to jump in and help out. We've never really had a problem at Yosemite with anyone having an issue. Well, I think it was Mrs. Sale, but she passed out. And Dr. Joel was speaking, and she was sitting next to the older doctor who gets up and screams, I'm in charge. I'll take care. <laughs> so we adapted. This conference, we have not had to adapt. Everything has gone very well. Part of that, I'm sure, is in the last three or four months, we've taken one day with brothers to come together and pray for this conference. And the Lord has blessed it. We haven't had to adapt. Uh, hopefully, no one passes out. We're in good shape while you're speaking. So. But uh, I, I've uh, considered Dr. Joe a, a friend and a brother in the Lord since the first time I've met him, and it's uh, uh, good to have him back. It's been fantastic to have uh, Joe Reese back. So we'll see what goes on from here on, but this has been a blessed conference. There's some new faces. Welcome. If I haven't welcomed you before, you are welcome here. The uh, If you have not, gotten a copy of uh, or been able to be to all of the uh, meetings. We do have CDs in the back, M MP3s. It is online. Talk to Jason back there. He'll tell you what what is available. If you're going to order and have a, a CD shipped to you, make sure you fill out the form that's in the back. Again, talk to uh, Jason. If you are going to uh, buy books, uh, those are Gospel Folio Press. We make nothing off those. There is a charge if you uh, use a uh, credit card. We can accommodate that. That is exactly the cost that it is to us. That's what you pay. So the chapel is making no money off of those books. They're available at a much reduced price of what Gospel Folio sells them for. So those are available. Remember, again, I've talked about it the whole conference, Camp Hope. We have uh, some uh, flyers in the back. 
that talk about what Camp Hope is. We have the young ladies from Silica Chapel. You can talk to them. Silica Chapel is the one that puts on Camp Hope. And uh, it's been a blessing for the last 10 years, and that will continue, I'm sure. The Yosemite Conference, talk to Dave or myself about that if you're interested at all in the Yosemite Conference. And also you can talk to me, the Old Mount Hermon Conference, Pacific Bible uh, Ministries. Go ahead, and uh, it's a great time. It looks like we're going to have some younger folks stepping up and going to that this year. Is that for me? Yes. <laughs> And anything lost and found, you found something, you lost something, make sure you talk to me about that. Uh, Bob is going to come up and open in prayer for us. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you again for your love to us, this displayed and expressed through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, what a privilege this morning it was to gather to him, to remember him in the beauty of his person. Oh, Father, what a Savior we have. There's none like him. And Father, we thank you that through this weekend we have learned more from your word about thy Son. All the attributes of thee, of the Father, are found in him and expressed in a human form that we can understand and relate to and appreciate. Father, we, we long for that day when we shall see him face to face. Now, Father, as we conclude these meetings, we thank you for our, the brothers you have brought to us. We thank you for their ministry. We pray that you will continue to bless them in their work, bless their families. And Father, we thank you that you have used them in this mighty way and will continue to do so in the future. So, Father, we pray your hand upon them and upon all of us in our Savior's name. Amen. Years ago, there was a, I think it was an Upload conference in Toronto that I had the opportunity to go to. And um, during, between the sessions, this elderly lady was coming down the stairs at the convention there and, uh, and uh, slipped and had, a, had an accident with her, her, with her leg. And with, in less than five minutes, we had four doctors and a nurse. And I think most of them were from the uh, McHale family. I think the mom, the dad, Joe, and I don't know if he threw in his brother or not, I don't know. No. But uh, and then another nurse, so that that lady was well taken care of. It's really been great. Um, our final song, and then we'll have a special, and then we'll hear from our brother Joe. Number four eleven. This is the one thing, the theme. I think we can draw from both of our speakers. Once far from God and dead in sin, no light my heart could see, but in God's word, the light I found. Now Christ liveth in me. Number four hundred and eleven. Once far from God and dead in sin, no light my heart could see. But in the word, the light I found, now Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth, Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth. Oh, what a salvation this that Christ liveth in me. As rays of light from yonder sun, the flowers of her set free. So life and light and love came forth from Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation this that Christ liveth in me, as lives the flower within the seed, as in the cold the tree. So praise the God of truth and grace liveth in me. in Christ liveth in hope. What a salvation this, that Christ 
liveth in me. With longing how my heart is filled, that like him I may be. As on the wondrous thought I dwell, that Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in Christ liveth in Christ liveth in Christ liveth. Oh, what a salvation this that Christ liveth in me. And all the people of God said, and we'll hear from our uh, have a special right now. To see my name 
is crushed to death. Life is mine to live. One through yourself that's love is the power of the cross. Son of God, slain for us. God alone. That's a tough act to follow. Thank you, young people. Now that I'm part of the over 35 club. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, David, wherever you are. Next time it's 41 and below and 42 and above, right? Actually, for next year it'll be 42 and below. Um, I was very moved by that song, not only because of the content of it, but of course who is singing it. The privilege of spending a good time with the young people last night. Time of the Word of God, time understanding campfire churros. I'm still having a little bit of angina from it. But, um, the, uh, I hope everyone who wasn't standing on the pl platform here a few minutes ago was moved by that. These aren't just young people with good voices, great voices. These are young people who love the Lord Jesus. And having the privilege as I do to travel and I can speak from my Dear Brother Joe, who travels much more than I do ministering the Word of God, nothing warms the heart more than to see young people sold out to the Lord Jesus, who've seen what the world has to offer and say, if that's what the world has, they can keep it. Some have heard me say this hundreds of times, and I'll say it again. What the Lord gives us is better than what the world has. Don't fall into thinking that it's only going to get better when we get to heaven. It will. I'll give you that. We've got it better here and now. Thanks, bro. We've got it better here and now. And these young people were testimony to that. Well, let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 6. While we're turning there, let me say uh, thank you again so much to uh, the conveners and Rod. I definitely, can, I definitely consider you a friend, bro. Absolutely. I see that we've set the objective or the, the, the expectations very high for this meeting. The, the objective for this meeting is for no one to pass out. All right? So... <laughs> As a preacher, you know, I, I give a lot of talks for medicine. Uh, one of the things I learned when I, I did my master's of education is when, when you give a talk now in medical education, you're meant to set objectives. So you have to provide objectives before a talk. It's accredited. And I always say, if you just use a different verb for every objective, you look intelligent, even if you're not. I'm very good at looking intelligent when I'm not, so I've, I've trained in that. And um, so the objective for the day would be uh, not to pass out. So let's hope that that doesn't happen. If so, um, Rod will take care of you. Um, but I must say, it's just a privilege to be here. I, I know this is being live streamed and other assemblies can hear it, so I've got to be careful what I say, but I really love coming to Claremont. I mean that. Not only because it's only a one-hour flight and I still get home for Sunday night sushi night, but um, because I tremendously enjoy the fellowship here. I mean that. Thank you to the Markleys for hosting me and for just all of your uh, support and being able to be here with Joe Reese. Uh, is a privilege. Uh, you can always tell there's Big Joe and Little Joe that Little Joe gets the talks after lunch when everyone's fallen asleep, but that's okay. Um, but I've enjoyed Joe Reese's ministry immensely this weekend, and I trust you have too, and we trust that the impact of the weekend doesn't end when this message is over, uh, but not only the days, months, and if even eternity to come. John chapter 6, let's read from verse 25. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. 
labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. They said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? You see their line of questioning, it's reasonable. If you want us to trust you and you claim that you come from God, well, prove it. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. They said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. We'll stop our reading there, although of course it's tempting to read the rest of the passage. So very quickly, by way of review, we've been thinking about deserts this weekend. I left the desert of Arizona, heading back there tonight. Please uh, do pray for us, by the way. We're uh, thankful for your, your prayers. Uh, life is pretty busy these days at work, um, but uh, we're very thankful for, for that. And uh, Heather and the girls are doing well. For those who have been, I know a number of you have been asking, little Katie, so my little baby is now just turned six, and uh, Alyssa will soon be eight, and they're both daddy's girls which I'm very thankful for. And um, uh, please do pray for us and, and pray for our a little assembly, Palms Bible Fellowship, a rather small assembly, but uh, we have the same God. He's just as big. So please do pray for us. We've been thinking about deserts. So uh, we noticed that there are sort of three characteristics of deserts. They're desolate, they're dangerous, and they're dry. And yet they seem to be prolific in the Word of God. I read about deserts from Genesis to Revelation. Every place... Uh, it seems to be to the right and to the left, and in front of us and behind us are deserts in the Word of God. So there's much that we could learn, and we could spend many conferences talking about deserts, but we wanted to just focus our thinking a little bit about what happens in the deserts in the New Testament. In particular, nine places, if you will, or nine features of the desert. So, so far, we've looked at five of them, and hopefully we can finish the nine off this afternoon. So we saw that the desert was a place of solitude. And I encouraged you to go to the desert and be alone with God, how critical that is. So often we get busy and active, and fellowship with the Lord's people is marvelous. But when this conference is over, you need to be alone with God. We talked about the place of separation, where we take ourselves away, not just from spiritual activity, but from the world. And we talked about the notion of separation, where we find that fine line and fine balance of separating ourselves from the world system, but at the same time we're in the world to shed the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And God help us to be like Daniel, the example we gave, of someone who was willing to go to a pagan university, was willing to work in a pagan system, but drew the line when he said, I'm not going to eat that meat that's offered to idols. And I pray for each of you this week, in your homes and your workplaces, that you find what are the issues that you say no to, so that you can retain your testimony before God and genuinely come out from among, come out from among them and be separate. Thirdly, we saw it was a place of revelation. We talked a lot about this, about this beautiful uh, notion in the scripture of a connection between intimacy and revelation. That those who are the most intimate with the Lord have the greatest understanding, which makes sense. That's how you want it. You want to learn somebody. And I like to say God is not a subject to learn. He's a person to know. So don't look at the Bible per se as just a textbook. Look at it as an opportunity for God himself to reveal himself to you. He wants that. As we spend time in the Word of God, we learn more of him. And so we are encouraged to, in a sense, go out to the desert where we can be intimate with God and where he wants to reveal more of himself to us. We thought of the desert as a place of preparation. We noticed how fascinating it was that so many people in Scripture, both Old and New Testament, before the Lord commissioned them to a specific ministry activity, he seemed to bring them into the desert for a while. 
train them, to teach them. Whether it was Abraham, whether it was Moses. Moses, I think the greatest lesson he learned in the desert was the lesson of value. After seeing all that gold in Egypt, you know, Egyptians are pretty obsessed with gold, no disrespect. Uh, but um, after seeing all of that, he had to come to appreciate there was something far more valuable. Where there's the Apostle Paul and others, we see that they spent time in the desert preparing, and the Lord Jesus himself, the greatest example of which himself to us, of being prepared for that ministry. And if the Lord is going to use you, you need to be prepared. And there are many uh, aspects of that that we discussed. And then finally, yesterday, we talked a bit about rest. The Lord Jesus told his disciples they were so busy and active in the Lord's work and doing great things, but they needed time to rest as they didn't even have time for any leisure. And so he called them to the desert to rest. Interestingly, he called them out to rest, and the crowds joined them. And so he said, okay, well, we'll finish working with this group. But at the end, there were 12 baskets full. And there are times in your work in ministry where you feel like you're getting towards the E. Somehow the Lord just keeps the tank full for a little bit longer. But that little bit longer needs to be followed by a time of replenishment. And we talked about some danger signs in your life that might indicate that you're potentially burning out, that you need time to rest. Well, today in the time that we have left, I'd like to think briefly about four further aspects or characteristics, or features rather, of the, uh, of the desert. That is a place of nourishment. It's a place of testing. It's a place of searching. And it's a place of repentance. Nourishment, testing, searching, and repentance. The first of which is nourishment. Hence, we read the verses that we did here. We could read many others, of uh, the, not the, only the one example we gave of the Lord feeding. Uh, we know that there are other times when the Lord was in the desert and fed multitudes. I commented the other day that it was interesting to me that deserts are the place that have the least food, but the Lord seemed to feed people more there than anywhere else. Now, isn't that God's way? Well, he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, as we said. That where you would least expect to find food, God provides the food. And the important principle there, of course, that we've reiterated so many times this weekend, is that the Lord has the desert to teach us our dependence on him. Because it's not like the, 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 the disciples could just turn over to the left and find this beautiful garden in the middle of the desert and, and pluck up some fruits and vegetables and quickly whip together a Mediterranean salad. That wasn't going to happen. If they were going to be fed in the wilderness, if they were going to be fed in the desert, it was because God was doing the feeding. Let me tell you. If you're going to be nourished in spiritual things, it's because God is going to feed you. Yes, in a moment, I'm going to tell you about the importance that you have of seeking out that food and of nourishing yourself in one way. But let's remember, at the end of the day, God is the one who feeds. As the Lord Jesus said in this text, I am the bread of life. So if you're out there in the wilderness figuring that you can feed yourself and you don't need God, we say that of, of when we come to preach the gospel, that, that, that people need to understand that they can't live life without God. Well, sometimes, paradoxically, as believers, we know and we understand that, but when we want to engage in spiritual activity, we want to do great things for God, but we sort of think we can do it in our own capacity. And yes, the Lord has given us talents and abilities and spiritual gifts, and he wants you to use what you have. Sometimes we go to the other extreme where people uh, just say, well, I'll just wait here and, and expect God to do everything for me. Okay, Lord, do it, right? Well, I want to tell people about the gospel. Okay, Lord, and I open my mouth. You do the speaking. No. We commented the other day how marvelous, how often the Lord Jesus employed people when he did a miracle. But he always had them do what they could do, and he did the miraculous bit. So I can't save my neighbor, but I can share the Lord Jesus with them. And let the Spirit of God work on and convict his heart for salvation. I'm a partner with God. Co-labor together with him. And so the Lord help us to find that balance of appreciating that we desperately need him. We don't only need him, if you will, to come to the point of salvation. I need him every hour. As we sometimes sing in that old hymn, I need thee every hour. We need a moment by moment, don't we? So nourishment becomes important. You're going to starve, spiritually speaking, 
you're surely not going to starve at this conference. Are you kidding me? Like <laughs> between the churros and the Egyptian lentils, I'm I'm full, right? <laughs> Big breakfast at the Markleys. Um, you're going to starve spiritually in the desert if you don't allow the Lord to feed you. So let me ask them. How's your appetite? What you been eating? We commented the other day that if you go down to Egypt and eat, as the Jewish nation when they left Egypt were longing, you know, they were so upset. Oh, they, the belly aching started long before they crossed the water, right? You remember that? And they saw the Egyptians coming and they panicked again and said to, the, said to uh, 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 Moses, Oh, you brought us here. It would have, notice the phrase, it would have been better for us been back in Egypt. Perish the thought, but has that ever crossed your mind as a believer? Maybe it would have been better for me not to come to the Lord. Awful, isn't it? A misunderstanding of what the Lord can give you. And they long for the garlic leeks and onions and whatever other Food that made their bad breath, you know, that supported the Listerine community. What, uh, what, other, what other bad breath food you feed on? And the challenge is, of course, you, you eat that, and people smell it off of you. And that's a pretty good example of what happens when a Christian, when a believer goes and feeds in the world. It influences you so much, it starts to come out of your pores. People start noticing that your conversation's different, that you're interested in different things, that you start to go to fewer meetings, you're less excited about spiritual activities. Now, backsliding never happens overnight. Always a process. So where are you feeding? I mean, it's pretty simple. We've been designed in a fairly simple way. Your, your body is a reflection of a lot of things, but a lot of it has to do with what you eat, what you do with that food. Spiritually, it's the same way the Lord teaches us. Whatever comes in is going to fill in me, spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking, psychologically speaking, and that's what's going to be reflected. You spend three hours a day watching football, you're going to talk about football. I don't think there's anything expressly wrong with football, but expect it to happen. So be careful of lies what you see. Be careful what you watch, what you listen to, what you spend time doing, who you spend time with. All of those things are going to influence you. Sometimes we think we have this sort of brazen heart that I can do that and it's, it's not going to affect me. Be careful when you start down that line. Because it will affect you, I guarantee you. So just think. I challenged the young people a bit last night about specific times. So I think sometimes we get very general in our, in our ministry. We don't give specific challenges. So I want you to specifically think, what... If you were to lay out your spiritual diet over the last seven days, since last Sunday, what have you consumed? What's occupied your time? What have you been reading, thinking about, spending time, if you will, going over in your mind, meditating? What, what, what spiritual diet have you had? What effect do you expect it to have in you? Have you cultured an appetite for the things of God? We so often have a, a kind of simplistic view of spiritual things. We, we appreciate that the Lord died for us and, and we love Him, but we come to the Lord's Supper and it's a little bit stale in some ways because we, we kind of recirculate the same thoughts. And I want to be careful I'm saying this because there's no thought of the Lord Jesus that grows weary, if you will. There's nothing that is not worth repeating. I love to hear Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And my little girls sing that. It touches me because it's a simplicity that Jesus loves me. So I'm not trying to make it an academic exercise. Please don't misunderstand me. But haven't you gotten a little bit deeper? And we have a lot of beautiful children here this week, which has been fantastic to see. It makes me miss my little girls. But you know, if they had served during our main meals, the baby food that they had been having, a few people might have been raising eyebrows. I mean, really? 
mind you, oh, this, this, uh, this applesauce tastes pretty good. But, um, you, know, you know, we realize that we've, we've kind of gotten beyond that, haven't we? We've matured. We've gone from the early days, if you say, if you will, of milk and now getting into the so-called meat of the word. Are you maturing in your diet for God, in your appetite for the things of God? I'm not saying that you, you want to come to a conference and say, can we have a 38-part series on Ezekiel, please? I mean, that's, not, that's not my point. But have you gotten further? Think of where you were a year ago sitting at this conference, if you were here, Lord willing, last year. Have you matured in the faith since then? Are you growing more deeply? Is your understanding of the Word of God deeper? Is your relationship with Christ deeper? For all of us, we know we have have relationships, whether you've been married here for 50 years or are not even married yet. You have relationships, and you know how that develops and grows, and you learn more about that person. There's that sort of initial discovery phase, and you start to understand someone. That's marvelous. But that's just the appetizer. There's a depth that comes deeper and deeper and deeper with time. Have you done that with the Lord Jesus, or are you still kind of in the periphery It's time to dig a little bit deeper. It's time to enjoy some more food. Don't starve yourself, spiritually speaking. Think of the time that you spend uh, with the Lord. And, and one way I try and get uh, people to do this, I, I, I'm not going to do it as a formal exercise for time's sake, but maybe it will take a few seconds to do it. I want you to think for a moment about someone you love. Uh, someone here in your family or someone who may not be here, but another person that you care about deeply, right? Um, and uh, don't worry, there's no role play here. We're not going to break up into small groups. Um, but I want you for the next about 30 seconds or so, I want you to think about that person, all right? So I'll give you time. Have you identified who that person is in your mind? And I'm going to give you uh, 30 seconds and I want you to um, think about them. Go ahead. Okay, your time's up. Now, I'm not going to get you to tell who it was, what you thought about, but hopefully it wasn't very difficult for you. If anything, hopefully it was very easy for you. And the 30 seconds just flew by. And he said, oh, Dr. Joe, only if I had another two minutes, ten minutes, two hours to just think about that person. All right. Here's the second plan. I want you to do the same thing in the next 30 seconds and think about the Lord Jesus. Okay, time's up. Now I know we had a big meal, and I know it's hard to focus. But how did it go? Might be a bit sobering for some of us. Did you just have sort of simplistic views? And again, I, I'm not going to rob anyone of their enjoyment of the Lord Jesus, but did you just sort of, you know, a picture of the Lord on the cross or speaking to the crowds or. Was it something that was, if you will, more distant about the Lord Jesus or something very personal in your enjoyment of him? I'm not going to explore it much more, but I just want you to think about that. I think that we should be able to train our minds to enjoy the Lord Jesus. It's not hard. He's altogether lovely. I like to say that all the time. He's not hard to enjoy. There's no more enjoyable 
person in the universe than him. And yet, sometimes our capacity for enjoyment of the Lord is weak. How could it be? Your day should be a, a constant communication with him. Where you're constantly in, if you will, in conversation with him, discussing with him the, the, the day. And it relates to nourishment because what you spend your time feeding, what you spend your time pouring yourself in, that's what's going to influence your mind. And eventually, your heart, for the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, it'll come out of your actions. So if I'm thinking on those things that the Lord Jesus says, whatsoever things are good and pure and lovely, uh, you know that verse well of good report, of, of virtue, of praise. Think on these things. That those, All of those things relate to the person of the Lord Jesus. If I have the capacity to, to nourish myself with that bread of life, then my depth of enjoyment of the Lord is going to be deeper, and it is going to reflect in what I do. This isn't just a mind game. This isn't just an opportunity to focus. But where does your mind go? when you can sit down and relax, when you're waiting for an elevator, when you're sitting at that traffic light, when you have a long drive. That's not to say we can't listen to music or messages or whatever, but there should be an enjoyment in the believer's life of silence to enjoy the presence of the Lord Jesus. I'm not saying we can't enjoy the Lord when we're singing or listening to music or whatever else, but there has to be that capacity to enjoy the Lord. Well, that goes well beyond the principle of nourishment in the desert, but it's something I've been trying to think a little bit more about and train my mind and heart more to, if you will, enjoy the Lord Jesus. It's a place of nourishment. You know, as he spoke to the, to the crowds and much we could say about this passage, there they were, you know, thinking that, that uh, they wanted the food. You know, they came for food. They, they weren't that interested in spiritual things. And the Lord made it clear to them that the manna that they had in the wilderness was not from Moses. And that, of course, offended them. If you read the rest of the chapter, we won't take time, but this may have been one of the most striking moments in the ministry of the Lord Jesus that had so many people turn away. You know, we often think of the disciples that stayed with the Lord throughout his ministry, and there was likely sort of sets of disciples, meaning the 12, of course, but there were likely a group of 100 and maybe a group of 500, from what we understand, that followed the Lord Jesus a little less formally well, this is one of the passages here we read that there were a lot of people who just turned away and left. That was offensive to them, that they would have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And of course, he was not speaking of his physical flesh and blood. But let's remember that does offend people. When you feed on the Lord Jesus... You're going in contrast to what your friends and your colleagues and your neighbors are feeding on. They're feeding on a whole different diet of food. And if you find yourself so aligned and so easily connected to so many of those who don't know the Lord, it might be because your diet is not so appropriate. Think about that uh, as you come, go through this coming week. So it's a place of nourishment. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, please. It's not only a place of nourishment, it's a place of testing. In fact, when I mentioned the wilderness or the desert and the New Testament, many people would immediately turn to the temptation of Christ. Now, although the temptation of Christ is described, of course, it's described in all three synoptic Gospels here in Matthew 4, I'd like to back up a little bit and actually start at the end, towards the end of Matthew chapter 3. So turn with me in Matthew 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. And Jesus answered, said, Suffer it to be so, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went straightway up out of the water. Please notice this. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So if I can give you a little Bible study tip, 
I may have shared with some of you before. Remember that the Bible was written in books, not in chapters. And chapters are helpful. They're administratively helpful, so you can remember verses. But so often, when we're reading, we sort of naturally drop the thought at the end of a chapter. And that's why I, I ran into chapter 4, verse 1 here. Most chapter divisions, in particular in the New Testament, are quite well placed, with maybe the exception of the Gospel of John. Seems to me quite frustrating. So when you're reading the Gospel of John, the next time you're reading the Gospel of John, ignore the chapter divisions, please. Because very often, the last verse of a previous chapter is immediately connected to the verse, verse of the next chapter. So don't say, we're going to do a Bible study and stop at chapter 6, and we'll leave chapter 7 to next week. Don't, don't do that. Spend time beforehand learning where the natural divisions are in the text. And why do I focus on this? Well, the Lord Jesus is baptized of John here in the, world, in, in this, the end of chapter 3. The Lord... God, God the Father clearly enunciates His pleasure with His Son and said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then immediately the temptation of Christ comes thereafter. Here is lesson number one about the temptation of Christ. It wasn't to prove that God the Father was pleased with Him. God the Father was already pleased with Him. It wasn't a testing to say, mm, let's see if he can do it. And that's an important principle. I think it's a beautiful principle. It shows to us clearly that temptation of Christ is different, of course, unique when compared to our own temptation. I have something in me that can respond to sin. Believe me, I know it. The Lord Jesus was sin distinct. There was nothing in him to respond to sin. Not only did he not sin, he could not sin. The, what we call the impeccability of Christ is a critical theme and a critical doctrine I don't have time to explore with you today. But I just thought how beautifully the Spirit of God describes to us this event of the Lord Jesus being pronounced as the well-beloved Son, and then the temptation comes. Not that he endured the temptation, and therefore the Father is pleased with him. But look at what happens here, verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungered. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Lesson number two about testing or temptation. Satan is, if I can use the word, intelligent. Let's not be overly disrespectful, if I can use the word, of Satan. I don't say that we respect him in the sense that we look up to him and appreciate what he does. I mean respect by virtue of the sheer power that he yields. He wields a lot of power. He confesses, not in this uh, occurrence of the, um, of the temptation. You should look at the differences between the records of the, each of them. Uh, but he does confess in another one uh, when he's offering the Lord Jesus, if you will, the, the kingdoms of the universe. You know, he, he, he sort of intimates that have been given to me. It's almost like literally the phrase is almost as if he were to say, you know, I have these. Okay, I've got them on loan, but they're mine right now. In a sense, I want to be careful how I use the, the uh, real estate uh, terminology, but it's like he has a lease on the world. He doesn't own it. He has authority here, there's no doubt. But he doesn't own it. And Satan is wily. Joe mentioned the other day, it's like we are being pursued. That lion that's walking around, seeking whom he may devour. So we need to be careful that we don't speak of him disrespectfully. Of course, we know greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. I'll never deny that, of course. But when I see a t-shirt in a Christian bookstore that says, Satan can't touch this, I get uncomfortable. In one way, it's true. I am sealed. We heard that so beautifully yesterday. And Brother Joe, thank you for making it so abundantly clear to us. The eternal security of the believer. 
I enjoy that every day of my life. So I know that he can't rob me of my salvation. But oh, he can hurt me. And he can hurt my assembly and hurt my family and hurt a lot of people in the process. So we need to be careful and recognize that he knows. And it's fascinating, sad, in many respects. You know, you might say Satan knows my weaknesses and he's going to go after them. You know, he came to the Lord while he was hungry in the wilderness and started talking about bread. That's one tactic. But don't think he's only got one trick up his sleeve. He's got a whole cornucopia of tricks up his sleeve. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are the major themes, if you will. But he's done this many times before. In fact, in the scripture, don't we find often that people fall in the very strength that they have, not so much in their weakness. Abraham, great man of obedience, disobeyed God. Moses, meekest man all the earth, lost his temper. David, a man after God's own heart, gave it to someone inappropriately. And the list goes on. So it's not just about that weakness that you might have, that 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 kink in the uh, that that little uh, opening in the armor where you know someone might be able to reach you. Sometimes Satan goes right down the middle, right at your very strength. Third lesson: the Lord is teaching us something wonderful here. Not only is the Lord Jesus impeccable, not only do we need to be, if you will, respectful of Satan. Thirdly, notice in the Lord teaching us here of the paramount importance of the Word of God in times of testing. The Lord Jesus is the very author of the Word of God, and he's quoting it. I won't take time to go through the whole of the testing as you know it, but in each of the occasions, for each te temptation that Satan lays before the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus responds with the Word of God. Satan tries to twist the word of God. He tries to malign it. But the Lord answers with the word of God. If you're going to face testing this week, and let me just uh, you know, take a wild guess that there might be one or two people in this room who are going to face temptation this week. So my friends in New York say, am I right or am I right? They don't give you a choice. I'm right. And that's not to be facetious about temptation, but it's to remind us of its prolific nature. And it's hard for me to deal with it if I don't know the Word of God. And not just in an academic setting. The Lord is teaching us here that if we are going to face these, these trials, these temptations, we need to be in the Word of God because the Word of God is what's going to protect us. All of that armor we described the other day, we need that at our disposal if we're going to overcome the testing. Fourth and final lesson, praise God, we know it already. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Lord Jesus didn't succumb to temptation. But he has the ability to come to you in your time of challenge. Scripture reminds us that he is able to succor those who are tested, or those who are tempted, because he himself was. That isn't just a, a parlay sense of the word. That isn't just a, a, a sort of a nicety to say, I've been through some tough times, so I know what you're going through. No, no. It's much deeper than that. I did a series in a conference once entitled, Things God Knows. I mean, one way it could be a pretty quick meeting, right? He knows everything, and we're done, right? <laughs> but I like it when the scripture explicitly, when God says, I know something. So if he tells you that, there's got to be some significance to it. And so he's speaking to Moses in, in the, early on in the book of Exodus, and he says, I've seen the affliction of my people. I've heard their cry. Notice the different senses that he's using. But then he says, this beautiful phrase, for I know their sorrow. How does God know sorrow? Well, you could say he's omniscient. He knows everything. Fair enough. But let me tell you that the Lord Jesus knows sorrow like no one else. The words would ring out, Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow. This is the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. 
and maybe no one else in this room or this planet understands the sorrow of your heart and what you've had to go through. Let me tell you, he knows your sorrow. And he doesn't just know it in his head. He knows it in a way that he can be to you what no one else can be. We've all sorrowed in different ways, in different capacities. It affects different people in different ways. Please know that the Lord Jesus cares about every one of them. Marvelous. The testing, the temptations come, the challenges come. But we have a victor. We've read the end of the book, right? We know what happens. And that's not to make light of what you're going through right now. And as I said, maybe no one understands. Maybe no one even knows what you're going through. The personal pain and struggle you have in your heart today. But let me tell you, let those words of Exodus ring true in your heart. I know their sorrow. The beauty of it is, the Lord didn't just say, okay, Moses, I know their sorrow. See you later. <laughs> he did something about it. God doesn't just know what you're suffering through and the heartache of your situation. He wants to help, and he will. And he can help in a way that no one else can. So maybe you've been carried off into the wilderness. It seems to me that very often, much like the experience here of the Lord Jesus, that right after a marvelous event is when you seem to be in the wilderness facing temptation. A great conference like this, ministry and encouragement and fellowship together, iron sharpening iron, we're getting stronger. Monday morning hits. Watch out for what may come this week. place of testing. Time is going quickly. It's a place of searching. Turn over, please, to Luke chapter 4. We'll be brief in these final two. It's just one little verse, but I, I quite like it. Speaking of the crowds, of course, coming to the Lord Jesus, and we've made reference to this a few times already, but I, I like the way it's stated in Luke 4. And verse 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. It's a beautiful expression. Notice the, the series of events. They didn't just, okay, let's go looking. They, they saw him, so they sought him rather, so they went out to find him. The next level, if you will, is, is they stayed him. It's, you almost take the word at face value. It's like stay, right? Not to perseverate on this too much, but it's like Katie when I'm leaving to the airport. Daddy, stay. You're lucky I came to this conference. No, no. Um, uh, that little girl has an opportunity to twist Daddy's heart in a way that, oh, it's wonderful. But they're praying me through it. My girls pray for this conference. She might be six years old and doesn't fully understand it. But she said to me, I was leaving, Daddy, you're going to go tell those people about Jesus, right? That's the agenda, honey. Absolutely. You surely don't want, them to go, want me to go and talk to them about hematology and multiple myeloma. That would bore you all. I'm thankful I have something better to tell. But stayed him. And not only did they stay him, as the end of the verse says, that he should not depart from them. It wasn't just, I'm going to come see you, and you have that kind of nice conversation over coffee between the meetings, and you get that sort of feeling, okay, this conversation's over, you know, awkward, let's move on. Was it like to say awkward party of one? Awkward party of one. You know, that, that, uh, that you know, it's time, to, it's time to move on. No, they, they not only wanted to stay, to meet him, they didn't want him to leave. Let me ask you, have you had that experience? Where you, you maybe it's, you're reading your Bible, 
Maybe you're sitting at a Lord's Supper. All of a sudden, the clock means almost nothing. He just gets so enjoying the Lord. Look, we have the same experience with each other, right? Don't you know what it's like to spend time with someone? You're like, I can't, I can't believe how time flies when we're together. You know, it's, insert nausea here. You know, um, and and time just flies. Am I doing okay? All right, okay, good. Um, my Sacramento crew here are making sure that I occasionally keep the message humorous. Um, but you know, time flies when we're together. What, do you have that same experience with the Lord? Where you, you're literally saying, Lord, don't leave. You know he won't. If anything, it's the opposite, isn't it? I wonder at times when we're sitting and we rush through reading or we rush through a prayer, we rush through the Lord's Supper, whatever event an opportunity we have to spend with the Lord, and the Lord is saying, Joe, don't leave. I hope you've tasted of that. Remember I gave you the example the other day of David? When, 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 he, when he came to the Lord and said, Lord, I want to build you a house. And the Lord said, no, no, I'm going to build you a house. No, no, really, Lord, I'm going to build you. No, 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 I, I insist. I want to build you. And they had this sort of almost little, little banter back and forth, and eventually... David, of course, had to succumb. And he sat in the presence of the Lord. I, I imagine him sitting there, not because he wasn't strong enough to stand, but it's almost as if he said, I'm going to enjoy this for a while. I'm going to pull up a seat. And he calls out to the Lord and says, Oh Lord, do as thou hast said. When was your last sit-down moment? When was the last time you literally had to sit down in front of the Lord and say, Oh Lord, you're so good to me. Just do it. Do it what you've said. I'm going to sit here and bask in the glow of it. If you can't think of a time like that recently or any time, can I tell you? You're missing it. You're missing out. It's not just an emotional time. I know I'm Joe Preacher emotional and I get all verklempt, but look beyond the tears. It's more than emotion. It's the genuine understanding that we are in the presence of the God of the universe and he loves me. Like he wants to spend time with me. Do you get that? He wants to spend time with you. It's remarkable, isn't it? You're not far from L.A. here and all the hubbub and all these famous people and little did I know that I was on a plane the other day flying to LA a few weeks ago and apparently some really important person was sitting next to me. Everybody else on the plane knew who they were. I didn't. I was like, am I supposed to know who you are? <laughs> people vying for their time. The Lord Jesus is waiting for you to spend time with him. Marvelous. Are you searching him? There are other times that they were searching in the desert. Of course, time fails us. I love the story of the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. He happens to be in the desert. Isn't that extraordinary? That's when he finds Christ. He was just in Jerusalem, like the most religious city on the planet. You'd think if you're going to find God, you'd find him in Jerusalem. But he didn't. He found him in the middle of nowhere. Reading the book of Isaiah, and Philip was sent down. And that's where he discovered Christ. I'm not saying that you're not going to search for the Lord here in a meeting. Of course you are. If you're going to search out Christ and learn more of him, come learn of me, he says. It's because you've gone out to the desert to do so. Well, I've set you on a few trips to the desert. If you happen to land in Scottsdale when you're out there, come, come visit us. But the desert is the place of searching. And finally, Mark chapter 1, we'll close here. Mark chapter 1, we've made reference already uh, to um, John the Baptist frequently. But the desert is finally the place of repentance. The place of solitude, separation, revelation, preparation, rest, nourishment, testing, searching, 
and now hear of repentance. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness, and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. These people were not baptized in the way that we would have baptisms here. I'm not sure if you have a baptismal tank somewhere. I'm sure that maybe there's one hidden under the ground here or something. My pool is the official baptismal tank of Palms Bible Fellowship. So we come over to our house and use the pool. But um, it's a different kind of baptism than what we experience today. This baptism, the baptism of John, of course, was not that they were state, stating to the world that they had come to Christ already and were identifying themselves with Christ as we do when we are baptized. This was the baptism of repentance. This was a national call. This was a call out not to just the corporate nation, nation of Israel, but to individuals of saying, if someone is going to come to Christ, they need to repent. And we, of course, appropriately discuss the absolute mandatory importance of repentance for salvation. That it is inherent to biblical faith. And repentance isn't that someone just feels sorry, or the Canadians say sorry, for their sins. It's much more than that. It's a recognizing, it's, if you will, it's, it's taking an ownership of one's sin. Recognizing that, that that sin is offensive to God. It's not just because someone gets caught and they say, oh yeah, that was the wrong thing to do. Had they not got caught, they wouldn't have really worried about doing it. That's not true repentance. There is regret that doesn't quite match repentance. Maybe the best example of that in Scripture, and some may challenge it, but, um, well, this was good. Little Joe and Big Joe. I only saw that now in the cups. Well done. <laughs> I might be tempted to taste the Big Joe cup. <laughs> but um, um, Saul, I don't think Saul was ever saved. He came so close. He even cried, remember? When he called out to David, weeping. It says, he lifted up his voice and he wept that he was putting David's life in danger. But he never, never genuinely repented. Never took genuine ownership of his sin. Never recognized that it was an offense to God. He was not willing to turn from that way of thinking. Saul represents independence of God. So happens when you have a head that's that big. Remember he's head and shoulders above everybody else? Which as some of you heard me say, it either means he was this much taller than everybody else, or the expression could literally mean he had a bigger head than anybody else. You want some studies? If, I have, if you haven't heard me say this before and go and do it, go study First and Second Samuel. I know they're long books. Remember, there's no book in the Bible that you can't read in less than three hours. Two and a half hours about max for the longest books of the, of the Bible. You go read First and Second Samuel and watch for heads. There are heads everywhere. There are big heads, there are small heads, there are heads getting cut off, there are heads getting cut in trees. I might be a bit presumptuous, but the Lord is teaching us a lesson about headship, right? And Saul's head was his problem. He thought himself big enough that he could do things without God. And as Dr. Gooding so beautifully pointed out to us once at a conference, he said, you know, the problem with being the big kid on the block is that eventually a bigger kid moves in. So if Saul was all about his big head and his bigness and how he could rule by the power of his, of his might, what does God send? Goliath. I mean, it's almost comical, isn't it? Saul, so, you want big? I'll show you big. Enter stage left, Goliath. Massive, ginormous. When you trust in bigness, you're going to fail. Unless, of course, you're trusting in the bigness of your God, which is what David did. Saul was like a baby weeping in his tent 
when he saw Goliath. What was David? I, these are my favorite words of David. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? People are like, shh, David. Like, come on, man, bring it down a notch. Like, people can hear you. But he was ready. Because the same God that helped him take care of the lion and the bear was going to take care of that uncircumcised Philistine. Sure enough, he did. Saul, oh, he was regretful and he wept. But never came to the point of repentance. Is it possible, as Joe spoke to us this morning, is there someone here that has been regretful, maybe, but has never genuinely come to the point of repentance? Or for those of us who have, as when we spoke of Jacob, repentance is not only for the unbeliever, but it has a role in our life too, doesn't it? Sin can occupy your heart and life. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Maybe there's someone here today, I'm not trying to pick on any one person individually. The Spirit of God will do that for you. What is it you need to repent of? Maybe you need to take a sobering and challenging walk out into the wilderness to deal with that issue in your life. You know, you can't just wake up one morning and say, I'm putting it all behind me, uh, you know, just, Lord, forgive me for everything I've done. Uh, I'm just going to move on. Well, yes, in one way it's true. He's faithful, to give us, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But I think that's why the Lord Jesus, when he wrestled with Jacob that night, asked Jacob the question, what is your name, that was so specific to his sin. You need to go back to the thing that got you off the rails to begin with. And settle that issue. Repent that issue before you're going to be back in happy fellowship with the Lord. We've heard already it's not an issue of relationship. Relationship secure. It's your fellowship, your testimony, your influence on others. Careful how I say it, but even the impact that secret sins have on the assembly at large sobering way to end our conference, perhaps an appropriate one. Time is gone. And maybe next year, perhaps, we'll see if the Lord hasn't returned. Maybe we'll infuse some water, put in an irrigation system, and talk about gardens. I love the stories of gardens. Do a little bit of homework. Read about gardens before next year. I'm not going to preset my agenda because the Lord may change it between now and then. But I've been enjoying gardens in the Bible. Gardens, oh, I could go on, I'll stop. <laughs> but as we close off the conference, as we close off this message, my trust and prayer, honestly, is that your experience in the desert is going to change. For some of you, you need to spend more time alone with the Lord. For others of you, you need to separate yourselves more from the world. For some, you may need a time of repentance. The Lord knows your heart. But my prayer is that this won't just be an academic exercise and a list of nine interesting things, but things that will change and impact your life. Oh, thank God that we have a God who can feed us, who can protect us, the living water that makes the desert habitable. Because indeed, what we have in the Lord is so precious. I hope you're enjoying him today. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful to be here. We're grateful for the opportunity to meet with thy people, to be encouraged, to be lifted up. Father, I pray earnestly and genuinely for every single person in this room and everyone who hears this message, that they would come out to the desert. We would follow the lead, follow the leading of our Lord Jesus and come out to him. Father, we're so thankful he's the bread of life. We're so thankful that he gives us that manna from heaven, that he is indeed that manna from heaven that will cause us never to hunger and thirst again. Bless us, we pray. We pray for those who are traveling today. We know some have a long trip. Be with them. Encourage them. Strengthen them. Father, we pray for all of us tomorrow. We know the temptations and testings may come as soon as tonight, if not tomorrow. And We pray that we will be well-armed 
to serve our God. Bless us now, Father, encourage us in our Savior's name. Amen. The uh, CDs and MP3, Jason's back there, if anyone would like to talk to him. The book area, uh, David Dixon can be over there. So feel free, a little bit of time to talk to each other and take care of business there. Uh, we'll be here as long as we need to. Thank you for coming.